the evening to join us. And also a big thank you to Emma and Why Not Australia for um, uh, setting this up because uh, it sounds as though it's going to be absolutely fascinating. I think we all know um, that uh, Italian grape varieties particularly are starting to become very, very interesting in Australia. Uh, but how many of us know the background of why they're there and who brought them there? And it's down to the Chalmers family. Um, Kim um, actually had began her career not in, in wine, in uh, music, uh, but she came back to the wine roots in 2005. And since then, um, she's really been very instrumental in building up uh, the Italian uh, side of, of the business. And the Chalmers are particularly nursery um, men and women rather than um, just uh, winemakers. They make wine from, from their grapes. And actually what's fascinating, they make um, very small batch uh, um, uh, of the, these, uh, these varieties and they sell them. It's not just, they don't just sit in the, in the winery for geeky people to look at them. They actually sell them, which is brilliant. But let's uh, let Kim talk about it because she must have so much to say. Over to you, Kim. Good morning and thank you so much for having me. I, um, I feel very honoured to have been asked to come and speak to you guys about this, what I think is a very important topic um, at a crucial time in the Australian industry for this, this movement, which you know some call alternative varieties. For want of a better word, I suppose I'll start there and just say um, this sort of group of varieties that fall outside the mainstream or say veering away from the traditional international varieties. Um, the term alternative was coined by um, my parents and Stefano De Pieri, the, the famous chef from our region who, who helped start the Alternative Variety Wine Show and a chap called Dr. Rod Bonfiglioli, who was an internationally recognized doctor of molecular virology and a passionate vine man. He was working with us at the time um, in our nursery when we got into um, Italian varieties and um, and when they were talking about how do we you know how do we talk about um, this whole swathe of other varieties other than Chardonnay, Shiraz, Cabernet, Merlot etc. Um, what are they you know what are we going to call them? Well they're the alternative to the mainstream so that's where that word came from. It's not alternative as in you know dreadlocked um, tie-dye wearing alternative lifestyle it means something other than what we're all accustomed to is basically where that term came from I think it's almost becoming um, outgrown by where we're at with these varieties in Australia now um, but I think the term has a sort of uh, a warm fuzziness there from its history that we that we still use because these varieties are just becoming part of the wine landscape in Australia so how did it all start I mean before my family got into it. There were people, you know, looking into working with, with other varieties in the 80s and 90s, for instance, um, Carlo Carino, who came back from a stint in Sicily and planted Sangiovese in, in central New South Wales. Um, the Pizzini family, who started growing Nebbiolo in the late 80s, early 90s in, in the King Valley and things like that in terms of Italian varieties. Of course, there's many varieties such as Malbec and Massan and, and, you know, even Dolcetto, which have been here since the very, very early days. There's some 150-year-old vineyards of Dolcetto in Australia, would you believe? So when we say alternative, uh, we use that term because it, it, you know, sort of captures those varieties which are not necessarily emerging or new. They've been here for a long, long time, longer than, say, maybe Chardonnay. Um, but they are not necessarily the known varieties. So that's where that whole terminology came from. So there, be, there was became an interest, I suppose, a, a stronger interest in these other opportunities for grape growers and winemakers in Australia. Um, I suppose during and throughout the boom of Australian wine internationally, of which the UK was the centre. Um, if you think about the 90s and, you know, sunshine in a bottle and all this sort of delicious, juicy red wine that was changing the way um, people drank wine, people thought about wine, you know, it was approachable in the supermarket um, at, a, at a price and a style that attracted lots of new consumers to wine. And it sort of set up this idea of Australian wine 
um, globally that we're still, I guess, trying to grow out of now as, a, as an industry and as a wine growing country. Um, I don't think we're the only country in the new world that has this, um, is going through this sort of teenage phase. Um, we feel in Australia, we're, we're much older than teenage, but probably on the global level, some of those um, ideas are still coming to the fore. So my uh, family were, were fifth generation farmers, um, first generation in grapes and wine. So my parents planted vineyards in the 70s and 80s. And then in the 90s, as Australian wine started to take off globally, um, they were green thumbs. They were always interested in, you know, the next big thing. What could they grow? You know, they started off, you know, growing vegetables and growing fine merino wool, and they would have a go at growing anything that they thought might do well. And I remember as a kid in the 80s, they were growing okra. I mean, who'd even heard of okra in Australia in the 80s? And so they were always kind of had their eye on the prize of what's the next big thing? So whilst in the 90s, we were the largest wholesale grapevine nursery in Australia, I think in our biggest year, we grafted about 4 million vines in one year. Um, whilst that was all happening um, and grapevines were going off in all directions to all regions and they were the same four or five varieties predominantly. And so mum and dad had this sort of eye to the future really because they were seeing what the vineyards of the future were going to be because they were creating these vines. And Shiraz, you know, as we know, Wine Australia would be able to tell you is grown in every single wine growing region in Australia and some areas that aren't even officially classified as wine growing regions. So there was this opportunity to start to look for a bit of diversity, to start to look at what else we could do. We could clearly do these varieties well. They're doing well on the international stage. We're, you know, getting some great um, stories and quality and brands growing up around these Australian wines. This is, you know, in the 90s and 2000s. But how can we make the story more interesting for the growers, for the consumers, and particularly in our um, in our eyes, it was about the viticulture. You know, we're, we're not a wine family. We're, we're a viticulture family. We're a farming family. So we're thinking about, like the okra, what can we grow that's going to do really well in our particular patch of land and, and be unique and be, and be able to uh, tell a story and produce a product, uh, make a wine that's going to have its own personality and find its own place in the world. So during the late 90s was when this Dr. Rod... Bonfiglioli was working for us and he was a sort of a mad scientist type character in fact I've got a bottle here this is a this is a wine label that we um that we dedicated to him dot is uh is the uh, abbreviation of uh, dottore in Italian and this is what he looked like he had the wild hair and the glasses and you know smoked roll your own cigarettes and rocked up at work at lunchtime and worked till two in the morning and he was more more of an artist than a <laughs> than a scientist in some ways and he was this mad passionate guy and he was just said to us listen you've got to you know this is the opportunity now's the time we he had great contacts in northern Italy he'd worked at the University of Udine and at the time he was there he met um, people from the Rauchero nursery uh, VCR in Friuli which is the largest vine nursery in the world and they have a really amazing research program where they put you know, years and years worth of work into registering clones of Italian varieties and varieties from other parts of the world. Um, their R&D programs are just amazing and, and, you know, the quality of the work they do is fantastic. So he put us in touch with them and we became their Australian agent for a lot of their clones. And we also worked with Dr Alberto Antonini um, from... Tuscany, who is a famous flying winemaker and consultant and, um, and also sourced a suite of varieties for us to import into Australia. So that first sort of selection of varieties, which was really um, generated and inspired by, by Rod and, um, and these connections that we'd made in Italy, uh, was selected in 1998 and arrived into Australia in 2000, uh, arrived in 98, and they were released out of quarantine in 2000, 2001. So for those of you that have ever traveled to Australia, you know we have quite strict biosecurity regulations. You would have answered all the questions on the form when you flew in and had your shoes checked and had your cases scanned and all that sort of thing. And, you know, I think that's a good thing. We're an island continent, so we have the opportunity to to be stringent about biosecurity and it makes our whole agriculture industry 
um, much more um, safe and secure and healthy and, and whatnot because of that. So, of course, just bringing in a new vine variety is not as easy as just popping it in your suitcase and taking it home. Um, it's quite an involved process. So there's a lot of permits and all sorts of paperwork that needs to be done before you can actually send the vines over. And then once they arrive, they're flown into uh, Melbourne Airport. They're um, confiscated by customs and inspected immediately. If they pass the inspection, um, they are whisked off to a nursery that's actually run by the federal government in, um, in the outskirts of Melbourne. And they're actually struck and grown there for the first part of their life. So when you're wanting to bring a new variety into the country, you might send four or five sticks, dormant sticks, um, dormant cuttings. And from that, um, this nursery on behalf of the government will strike that, that cutting or those cuttings. And you may have one or two um, little pot plants, um, you know, that arrive. And that, so those plants need to live in quarantine um, under strict conditions of lockdown for, um, I'll just show you a little photo um, of lockdown for um, a period of, of a minimum of 18 months now, but back in the day in the late nineties, it was actually two and a half years. So it was a very long time between selecting the varieties and receiving them. So these, these, are, these are some varieties we have in quarantine now, actually Norello, Muscalese and Caracante, but this is the sort of thing that happens. So this, this is what they do. They grow this vine for you. And then um, at the end of that period of quarantine, you receive that little pot plant. And from that pot plant, you need to start to establish a revolution. <laughs> so um, it takes a bit of work propagating all those, that one little vine into, I guess, a nation of vineyards in the end. But, um, but so mum and dad's process um, back in the early 2000s was they got actually 70 different selections in that first import. It was about 35 varieties, um, but 70 clones altogether. So some of the varieties that were already starting to make a name for themselves, like Sangiovese and Nebbiolo, we imported multiple clones. But then we also had some wild cards in there, like Schiopatino and Pavana, Nociola, um, Alvazistriana, which if you think about the, the 1990s in Australia, I mean, we, we weren't even seeing imported wines of those varieties here at that time. So, so Mad Dr. Rod was a bit of a visionary in that way. Um, you know, helping select some of these varieties, which now um, are very suitable to, you know, consumer trends. People are, I don't know about over there, but in Australia, people are looking for sort of spicy, medium weight, fruit forward, you know, juicy reds that you can chill off a bit in summer and, um, and that sort of thing where Schiopatino and, and stuff like that really works. I mean, if you think about 1998, when these varieties were selected, um, people, bigger the better with reds, um, the more tannin, um, you know, the sort of fuller bodied, the better. So it was visionary on his behalf, um, making this selection of all these varieties to bring in. Um, so once they arrived here, um, we established um, a source block of them all. And, and my, my mum and dad, who are, you know, clearly ever the optimists, um, this is my, my family here. Um, Myself on the left, my husband, Bart, who's now our winemaker in the middle is my sister, Tanil, and then that's my mum, Jenny, and my dad, Bruce. So they started everything off, um, you know, on this crazy mission that we get to continue, which is great. But they, they were so excited. They thought, wow, we've got all these new varieties. And, you know, especially in the early 2000s, we were starting to obviously really think about climate change and, and you know, thinking a little bit more seriously about the some of the drier climates that we grow grapes in in Australia and, um, and how we can do a better job of that, you know, in terms of our water use and the wine quality and, and all sorts of things. And we had all these varieties from Sicily and Sardinia and all these opportunities to try new things and, and, you know, learn and grow and evolve. And so they went and had meetings with the big sort of wine companies at the time, you know, people who, you know, companies like Hardy's and South Gopnia who are now Treasury and Constellation and all the rest of it. And dad, you know, we worked with all these people in our vineyard business and, and dad was able to easily get an appointment with the, you know, the heads of these companies and in he'd go and say, listen, here we go, Vermentino's the next big thing, what do you reckon? And no one was interested, of course, they were all 
having a very nice time doing very well out of Shiraz and Chardonnay and, and whatnot at the time. And, you know, it, they, their attitude at that time was if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which is fair enough in terms of business. But, you know, with an eye on the future and, you know, a, a heart towards sustainability, we still wanted to really workshop and talk about these varieties. And so we changed tap completely. Instead of going to the top of the big companies, we went from the bottom up and we decided to start making wines from some of this fruit because by this stage, it was sort of 2003, 2004, we were starting to see the first grapes from these varieties and claims we, we had imported. And this nursery, original nursery block was here in the Murray-Darling region. So it's an inland dry area, it's low elevation, red sandy soils over limestone, but very low rainfall. Um, you know, if you think about something like Western Sicily with that sort of red sand masala with that red sandy soil and the sort of quite flat vineyards, it's like that, but very far from the sea. Um, and our annual average rainfall here is less than 300 mils. So, um, you know, we, we were seeing some of these varieties. We're, we're producing grapes that were just fresh and delicious with beautiful acidity and, you know, some of the later ripening reds were ripening at low sugar levels and we were able to make these wines, these delicious ripe um, red wines that were not um, too full bodied, not overly sweet, not over ripe and with finished alcohols around 13 instead of 14 or 15. Um, and so we decided to um, make the wines ourselves and that's when we started getting into wine. It was really as a promotional tool for the nursery. Um, and so we worked with a winemaker at the time who was really into hands-off winemaking, which now is pretty much a buzzword for all winemakers around the world, lo-fi, hands-off, minimal intervention, whatever you want to call it. But um, in the early 2000s, that wasn't the case. People just weren't around doing wild ferments and, you know, um, natural malos and all that sort of stuff. So we chose a winemaker who was working in that way because we deliberately wanted to make wines without the winemaker trying to fix them or mould them or correct them in any way. What, what our interest was in was really assessing that variety's performance in its new environment. So we wanted those grapes translated as directly into wine as possible with the minimum amount of uh, fluffing about. And if the wine was bad, then that was a sign that it wasn't the right place or wasn't the right way to grow those grapes. Um, and if the wine was good, then we were heading in the right direction. So we started with Australia's first Fermentino wine in 2004, Alienico, same year, Sagrantino, same year. Um, you know, we made the, one of the first Pianos along with Coriol in 2005. We make Greco, Pavanus, Gilbertino. Negro Amaro, um, Insolia, you name it, we've done, um, we've just actually more recently brought in a second round of imports which arrived in 2015 and we've got things like Falangina, Pieriroso, um, even Rubola Jala. So we, um, we've been the, the pioneers in terms of making these wines for the first time um, in a lot of cases, but we've also openly shared these varieties and our knowledge um, across the industry. And, and part of that has been through the Australian Alternative Varieties Wine Show, which was founded by Crazy Rod, Dr. Rod and uh, Stefano De Pieri, and um, who's a, a celebrity cook here in Australia and has a restaurant based in Mildura, um, and my parents. Um, that started in 1999. And the whole idea was we'd selected all these varieties to import you know, in Australia, there just weren't even that many of them available. Um, so it was about introducing these varieties um, as wines in the format of a long lunch and having a talk fest about what the potential of some of these varieties was. And um, it's really fascinating now to look back at the minutes um, and the notes and the photos from that original long Italian lunch, it was called in 1999, um, where we had people like Gary Crittenden and... Um, and Tim White, a journalist here, Max Allen, another journalist here in Australia. Uh, we had Mark Walpole, who's a legendary viticulturist in Australia, talking about the potential for Rafosco and Schiappettino in inland grape growing and all sorts of really interesting things that 20 years later just still seem so modern um, and so exciting. And it's great to have had many of those people involved in the Australian Alternative Wine Show throughout the years. So in that, on that first long Italian lunch, we had a bit of a, a taste of a Sangiovese challenge and it included a bunch of Australian made Sangioveses and a couple of Italian ones. I think it was 27 wines or something altogether. The next year it morphed into the Australian Italian variety 
tasting or whatever and we had a few other varieties a dolcetto and a, a nebbiolo and a couple of things and then it became what is now known as the australian alternative varieties wine show in 2001 so we had our 20th show this year um, and this year was an unusual one because of COVID and obviously all the bushfires. So we, we did have a reduction in the number of entries because there was a lot of producers that frankly just didn't make wine this year because of the bushfires and things. But our show is up to about in a normal year, 850 entries a year. Those 850 entries come from every single one of Australia's GIs, official GIs. So we have, you know, 66 or 65 different wine regions entering. Um, over 150 different producers and the wines that are entered into our show are made from 100 different grape varieties. Um, now we don't accept wines in our show that are, you know, what are considered the typical mainstream. So as I said before, you know, Riesling, Chardonnay, Shiraz, Cabernet, Merlot, etc., cetera, Savion. Um, more recently, we've graduated varieties like Pinot Grigio and now Prosecco because of their scale and their, you know, commercial success here in Australia. So, um, so it's really interesting to see that movement um, growing and changing and the quality of the wines and some of the bigger categories now are things like Tempranillo, Fiano, Vermentino, <clears throat> Nero Davila, um, Sangiovese. These are the varieties that are sort of really settled in in Australia and, um, and not so alternative anymore, although they're not certainly mainstream yet. Um, but, you know, why are we growing these varieties? We talked about diversity before with my family, but the big one really to understand is sustainability. And it's about smarter viticulture, you know, in one way we're so lucky in Australia that we don't have denomination laws that regulate what we can plant where. But that also opens up a can of worms for mistakes to be made. So the there's the open door for creativity, but it also means that sometimes, you know, you can get it wrong. Sometimes you can get it right. And <clears throat> I think that these varieties in Australia are providing more opportunities than setbacks. And I think that as we grow and mature as wine producers and we're understanding better the symbiotic relationship between sight variety, environment, et cetera. Um, we're getting much more characterful wines. We're getting much more authentic wines and having so many more varieties to choose from to be able to fine tune which viticultural characteristics you're searching for to fit your site, be it elevation, rainfall, <clears throat> soil type, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and particularly with many of Australia's wine growing regions, drought tolerance, heat tolerance, et cetera, um, climate change. Um, you know, many of our wine growing regions in Australia are already on the warm end. And with climate change, we just have to really be prepared for that to happen more frequently, for those seasons to be more frequent. It doesn't mean every year is going to be like that. But um, we need to start thinking about that because, you know, we're not thinking about uh, I was listening to some viticulturists speak the other day and they said, you know, often we make the mistake of thinking that a vines are an annual crop. You know, they're not lettuces. They are, it's permanent. <laughs> it's a permanent planting. What we're doing now, we need to be thinking about the next 50 years of or 100 years of. And so for us at Chalmers, the varieties that we've chosen to work with out of the suite of varieties that we brought in have been the ones that, that produce more elegant styles, more restrained styles um, in warmer areas. So we're looking for varieties that either ripen very early before the extreme heat of summer or very late after the extreme heat of summer to try and capture more moderate sugar levels, more moderate alcohols. We're looking for varieties which have naturally thick skins to protect them from sunburn but also to allow us um, less to spray less because they're naturally more resistant to pests and disease um, they're also you know we're also looking at varieties that have looser bunches so they're cooler and uh, on the really hot days and um, you know particularly we're looking for varieties that have good drought tolerance and heat tolerance now, often those two things are considered sort of the same, but they're actually not. So heat tolerance is the vine's ability to withstand an extreme heat spike. So 
Um, you know, is it going to shut down? Is it going to continue to thrive? Something like Neradavala will thrive at far higher temperatures than a no when a normal vine would shut up shop and, and, and stop working. Um, so that heat tolerance is one thing. And of course, the ability of the fruit to actually withstand that extreme heat. So bigger berried varieties, for instance, which in terms of traditional winemaking kind of theory would be of a lesser quality because you want a, you know, smaller berry for better skin ratio to juice, et cetera, et cetera. However, the bigger berried varieties are more hydrated and can handle those heat spikes better. So that's why when you go to the Mediterranean, Southern Italy, et cetera, you see a lot of those varieties are bigger berried and yet still make great wines. They're not dilute. They're not, um, you know, they're not watered down. They're actually um, stronger and more resilient because they're more hydrated. Um, and drought tolerance is, is sort of, um, I guess, related to vigor. So if you've got a vine that is very vigorous and can, can do really well with very little water, um, then it's going to A, require less irrigation in an irrigated area or B, survive on less rainfall in an unirrigated area. So, but out of all the characteristics that we're looking for, all those things are really important I've just talked about. But number one, top of the food chain, most important is natural acidity as far as charmers are concerned um, in terms of making fine wine in warmer climates. And I think um, across the board in Australia, seeing now people working with varieties like Fiano, um, varieties like Naradavala, um, and varieties like Alienico that naturally have um, much higher acidity where you're not having to adjust the acidity at all or as much in the winery. Um, you're retaining that freshness of flavour in the fruit itself right through to harvest where, you know, in the case of Fiano, you can actually get um, quite a bit of ripe, delicious fruit character into the, into the grapes and be harvesting them at a potential alcohol of up to 13 and still have lovely, crunchy, fresh acidity and not having to acidify the wine. In fact, the wine I've got in my glass tonight is an interesting one. It's a method traditional Fiano sparkling wine made from our Heathkit vineyard. Now, Heathkit is in central Victoria. It's about two hours north of Melbourne and it's a long, skinny region. Um, it's about 130 kilometres long. So the northern part and the southern part are quite different. The southern part is sort of granitic and quite cool. And the northern part is heading up towards the Murray River, which is the border between Victoria and New South Wales. And it has warm summers, but cool nights. It's inland, so it has an, a sort of inland climate. Um, now, you wouldn't expect to be making sparkling wine in a, in a region that has the warm summers like that, but Fiano allows us to do that. And not only does it allow us to do that, it allows us to make this method traditional sparkling without having to add any acidity in the winemaking process. So it has plenty of natural acid um, at harvest to, to go into sparkling production, even from a warm climate. And we actually don't have to dosage at the end either because we have enough ripe fruit to balance that wine. So we're able to make this sparkling from Fiano in a region you would not expect to be able to produce sparkling without having to adjust it on one end for acidity or the other end for sugar. So that for me, just, you know, again, just, um, coming from a viticultural perspective, thinking about wine can be just so different. Because for me, that says everything about that vine in that place is right. Because it's making this wine and without having to make too many tricks or make too many adjustments. So for me, that feels very right. Now, you might talk to the people on the other end marketing it and say, how on earth are we going to sell sparkling Fiano? <laughs> well, if the wine in the bottle's good, then hopefully that's half of the job. Um, but, you know, for me, this is where we've got to with alternative varieties, the alternative variety movement in Australia. And there's a lot of people now um, shying away from that term and going towards things like calling them climate appropriate varieties um, and, and that sort of thing. So I know that even here in Merbeen, so again, warmer and drier, um, the engine room of inland grape growing in Australia, the home of Lindemann's Bin 65, just up the road that's made. Um, yet we're able to make wines here from varieties like Fiano and Neradavala, uh, which we hand here can, you know, whole bunch press and whatnot without adjusting acidity and fine wines that 
um, that are fresh and delicious and, you know, really speak of their place. Um, having said that, I'm obviously talking a lot about warm, dry viticulture because that's where our vineyards are located. But this movement is not only about that. We've got varieties like Friolano that's flourishing in the Mornington Peninsula. We've got varieties like uh, Ribola Jalla, which we've just brought in, which who knows where that's even going to do well yet. Um, and varieties like Nebbiolo, of course, which are quite particular about where they like to grow. And we're just only after 30 years in Australia learning the best places um, to be able to produce great wine from varieties like that. And, um, and I think, you know, the maturity of uh, our approach to growing and making wine in this country um, is evident across the board in all varieties, in our Shiraz wines, which, um, you know, at one stage may have all tasted the same, no matter which region they came from to today, where it's very clear from 100 kilometres up the road to the next, the regional differences in those classic varieties. And I think, um, you know, that's just absolutely happening. And I'm really hoping that you guys, wherever you are in the world, are starting to see some of that or seeking it out or at least reading about it if you can't get the wines in your market. Um, but I think the, the alternative variety movement is almost... I guess it's easier almost for us because we're, we're writing our own playbook as we go. And, you know, the kind of big important take home for me, I suppose, that I always talk about when I'm out talking about why we do this, why we grow these varieties and why we make these wines is that we make Australian wine. We grow Australian wine. We make Heathkit wine. We make Victorian wine. We make wines from Mildura. We just happen to be using grapes that originated in Italy. They could have come from Greece or Slovenia or Turkey or France or anywhere else. Um, and we're quite comfortable um, with the idea that Shiraz is an Australian grape and no one's going up to the grape Barossa producers and asking them, you know, how does your wine compare to a Saint-Yosef? Because we think of Shiraz as Australian. So for me, this, as I said right at the beginning of my presentation, this idea of alternative varieties is almost outmoded because we're actually just Australian wine. We're just like very much like the Australian population. We're a mixed bag. It's multi-viticulturalism. And um, I think the big benefit is, you know, that we've, we've got just way more opportunities as producers to get that match between our site and our varieties right. And the last thing that I, I want is for someone to come to me and say, yes, yes, but uh, why would I buy your Vermentino when I can just get one from Sardinia? So I think really the, the message, I guess, is, is now making these wines, um, talking about these wines as Australian wines. You know, this is the future of, of regional Australian wine. Um, they, the regional Australian, authentic regional Australian wines of the future are going to be made from lots of different varieties. And the common thread among them all is that they're gonna speak of their place and they're gonna make sense, um, you know, in a, in a way that only makes sense to that person in that place. Um, and I think we're really heading in the right direction for that and alternative varieties have been a really good factor in getting us there. So I'm just going to share a couple of little pretty pics now. This is our um, source block in Merbein. So this is our, our home block where, where we live, where our winery is located and our office. And if you have a look to the right hand side of this vineyard, you can probably see that that little triangular shaped block and the one at the front, every single row looks slightly different. This is our, our mother block of all the nursery varieties. Um, they're all planted on a, uh, trained on a single cordon um, VSP, which is, you know, unusual for our district. Um, we record a lot of phenological data and analytical data of the um, grapes, the wine. We make all that information public on our website. Anyone who's had a bit of a look around, you've probably seen the variety data sheets. Um, including information from Italy, but also information from our experience here in Australia. Um, after we started making these varieties up here in the Murray-Darling region and we worked out that they were 
you know, quite making quite beautiful wines. And we actually decided to permanently include wine production in our portfolio of, of things we do as a family. Um, we decided to establish another vineyard. This is the Heathcote Vineyard that I was talking about in central Victoria. Um, we're actually um, not only nursery people, um, where we are the agents for all these varieties and graft and distribute vines around Australia. We're also grape growers for many winemakers. So between the vineyard you just saw in Merbein and this one in, in Heathcote, uh, we actually sell grapes to about 65 different winemakers. Um, the smallest batch of grapes we sell is about 200 kilos and the largest lot's about 200 tonnes. So we have all kinds of different sized and shaped wine producers purchasing grapes from us and all different varieties. So it's really interesting to see, you know, what people are doing with, with these varieties. And, you know, then as um, Liz mentioned at the start, um, we are constantly experimenting. We're constantly doing trials and we don't just blend them away like many wine producers do. We don't just tip them down the drain. Well, if they're no good, we tip them down the drain. That rarely happens. Um, but we just try all sorts of different winemaking processes, um, all sorts of different harvest dates. We document these things and then we bottle. So these Demijons, you can see in this photograph here, that's my sister and my husband, um, uh, you know, are anywhere between 10 and 50 litres. And that's it, that's the whole batch. And then when that wine's done, we bottle them and we sell them to the trade. Um, so you'll have a wine bar that might, you know, purchase the whole batch of that wine, which is 36 bottles and they'll pour it by the glass. And so general public can go and try the first or the only of this or that or a certain winemaking style. And, and by getting those wines out in the market, it advances the whole movement much quicker than, you know, just keeping everything in house and not sharing your knowledge. And that's one of the most beautiful things of all about the Alternative Varieties Wine Show, which just happened last week. And it was great to see a Gruner Veltliner get coming up as best wine of show, a white wine and a fairly new wine to Australia from the Adelaide Hills. Um, and, it, you know, what's great about that show is that it's a real family, it's a real community and all the producers that are working with all these different bits and bobs get together and they sit next to, you know, Fred Nurk from up the road from the next region at the seminar or at the lunch or at the dinner and they say oh I had a go at making Safaravi and it was terrible what you know oh well, I did that and I did this and we all learn from each other and I think that's what's allowed us to sort of in this short space of 20 years which is half a lifetime but you know a blip on the radar really in in the wine world um, to kind of get to where we are now where we're seeing some regionally distinct wines being made from things like Fiano Vermentino, Nero, Doubler, et cetera. So thank you. I'm sure you've probably got a million questions and I could just keep talking, but please fire them away at me. Thank you so much, Kim. What a fascinating talk and how very exciting everything is uh, in your region <laughs> and elsewhere. And I'm sure there are a number of members that have, um, or people today have any questions, um, please either put something in the chat or um, ask to unmute and ask uh, Kim your question personally. Okay. Hi, Kim. Hi. Um, I'm, from, I'm from Cape Town. Um, and we, I, we've been having quite a Twitter chat yesterday with Phil Reedman in Adelaide. Oh. Yes. <laughs> about importing and everything um, because we've recently had three new varieties um, allowed for the production of wine and we were discussing this whole quarantine thing and, and how it happens. Do, does anybody, um, do you pay for the new varieties you bring in or do you oh. get support? And um, you've said that the quarantine has gone down to 18 months because with us, it's about three years, I think. Mm. Yes. Yep. So it was two and a half years. So um, when we did our first importation, so the theory behind that was that um, they took the dormant cutting, they struck it, they let it grow, go dormant, grow, go dormant, and then grow again. And because the um, virus testing procedures at that time depended on um, woody tissue, and now with molecular testing um, being more effective, they can actually test for the quarantinable viruses 
um, at a younger stage of development of the vine, which is why they've contracted the quarantine period, but it is very expensive. So we, um, we're lucky that the, the nursery on the other end um, assists us with the shipping and getting it here and all of that stuff. Um, but we, and they contribute to the quarantine cost, but the cost per cultivar is anywhere between three and $5,000 per cultivar. And, and for that investment, you just get your one pot plant. And then from that one pot plant, you obviously have to propagate a number of vines and then plant a vineyard, which includes obviously all the establishment costs, the irrigation, the post, the wire, and then maintaining that vineyard every year. You know, there's some varieties in our original lot of imports that we brought in in the early 2000s that we've been growing and maintaining and looking after all that time and we've never once sold a vine. So the commercial reality of some of those ones is not awesome. But of course you can't, once you've put all that love into holding that variety in your collection, you can't just get rid of it for um, commercial reasons. So it's lucky that a lot of the other ones have been well taken up and have been successful and it sort of carries some of those other ones, but it is a very expensive exercise. Um, and it is something that, you know, used to be the domain of governments and um, industry associations and things, but, you know, budgets in the modern world are, so finely honed and there's just not a lot of spare money around for R&D like that. You know, in Australia, we had the, the, the National Science Organisation, the CSIRO used to bring in a lot of new varieties and they had a really strong um, germplasm collection of lots of varieties from around the world, which closed a few years ago and became inaccessible to um, the public. So it's really, and a lot of the vine associations, industry associations have just been so underfunded um, during the wine uh, glut period that we've come out of in the last few years that, that many of them have just closed down or, or become, you know, very minimally operational. So it's actually um, fallen to private nurseries um, like ourselves and, of course, like Yolumba um, Nursery or another famous uh, family-owned operation who have nurseries, mm. vineyards, wine bands, et cetera, much, much, much bigger than us, but... Um, fantastic investors and contributors to um, vine quality and diversity in Australia. Their, their forte is much more French varieties, whereas we're really clearly aimed at Italy. But yes, it is expensive, but having, you know, being 20 years down the track, um, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's been worth every piece of blood, sweat and tear that went into it. Yeah. <laughs> and Phil yeah. Reedman, by the way, I love that you brought him up because I nearly mentioned him earlier. He was one of the catalysts for this whole movement because he got up at a Australian Society of Viticulture and Enology um, seminar in 1997 or 98 um, here in Mildura, a viticulture seminar for the National Professional Association of the Industry. And at the time, he was the wine buyer for Tesco's in the mm. UK. Yeah. And he basically got up and said, Australian wine's becoming boring to this whole room of producers who just modelled their whole business on the UK export market, you know, because that was what Australian wine was, you know, really doing at the time. Um, and he said, you know, I want to see things coming across. I want something coming across my desk that will excite me. I want to hear new stories. I want to see, you know, um, new things coming from Australia. And that was actually one of the catalysts that actually drove um, the importation of all these new varieties and the passion of this group who started the Alternative Varieties Wine Show. So it's lovely to um, bring Phil back into the story there. Yeah. C can I just ask you, Kim, who, whose Gruner was it that won the, on the show? It was the um, Handoff Hill, the guys. Oh, yeah, Larry. Uh, we, Larry we were and Mark just, who introduced yeah. the variety um, to Australia yeah. and have done all the hard yards yeah. on that grape themselves. Um, you know, speaking of trial winemaking and yeah. I don't know, they've got quite a few different Gruner wines in their range. Yeah. It was their white mischief. Yeah. Um, Gruner that actually uh, won the wine of show. Okay. And their, their wines have always done well in our show because they're excellent yeah. wines. Um, yeah. But it's really lovely to see the, the pioneers of mm. that variety getting the gong, really. Yeah. You know he's a sapphire, of course, South African. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so is our vineyard manager. In, uh, <laughs> uh, so is our vineyard manager here in Merben. He came okay. from uh, Vergelege. 
Oh, okay. Yes. That's very really well pronounced, Kim. <laughs> yes, my husband's Dutch. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> well, we thank you, Angela. We have one question here from Sarah Jane Evans, Kim. She's asking if you have much experience with Spanish varieties, not just Tempranillo, but others. Personally, not so much. We've grown Tempranillo in the past. And, you know, in my opinion, I think it probably in Australia at least does better in the cooler climates because it's, um, you know, I said our kind of our sort of golden um, viticultural aspect we look for is high natural acidity and Tempranillo doesn't really have that, particularly in warmer areas. But there are some fantastic Tempranillo wines being made here now. Uh, I know that um, the South Australian Vine Improvement actually imported a whole bunch of improved Spanish and Portuguese varieties and clones into Australia over the last 10 years, and they're starting to make their way out. There's growers of um, Arinto and Verdejo, um, Graciano we have here in our vineyard too, um, which is doing um, quite well. And then, you know, some of the Port Portuguese varieties coming up um, Tariga Nacional, Tinta Barocca, Tinta Cal. Um, yeah, there's there's a smattering. Um, Tempranillo is obviously the strongest one. Graciano has been here for a while as well, but um, certainly some of those other varieties are starting to make a play. And I actually recommend if you're interested in seeing sort of what's out there that the Australian Alternative Varieties Wine Show, so A-A-V-W-S, the acronym, dot com, we actually have a full database that is fully searchable by the public of every wine that's ever been entered in the show from 2001 until now. Um, you can search year by year, you can look at trophy winners, but you can also search by variety, by gold medal or whatever across multiple years, across individual years, et cetera. And it's probably a good way to get a feel of course, not everybody enters wine shows. It's not a full picture of everything that happens in Australia, but we do have exhibitors, as I say, from every single region. Um, and it's probably a really good way to just have a bit of a browse around which varieties are being produced out there, how many of them there are, um, you know, having a look at how they scored. You know, as we all know, scores aren't everything. <laughs> um, and wine is subjective, so, you know, maybe it's not so much about who won what medal in what year but it's really just about getting a feel for what's out there uh-huh i think oh liz has sent a link to the yes, this was a ah. which emma sent us uh, when we were looking at this and it's very very interesting um about what's happening with the uh, ethno variety uh, Masculese. Well, um, I don't know about you guys, wherever you're tuning in from, but um, Etna Rosso is very popular in Australia right now um, with sommeliers and, you know, the Conoscenti. Um, it's, a, it's a really well-loved wine. Um, I actually did a, an Agri-Food Skills Fellowship in 2012 and travelled around southern Italy researching hot climate grape and wine production and its potential application in Australia and obviously visited Etna and, and lots of other places around the south of Italy and, you know, sort of shortlisted some varieties and looked at some of the varieties we already had, um, but also shortlisted some varieties that I thought could potentially do well here. And Norello Muscalese is a really interesting one because I think there's this love affair with Etna Rosso and um, that does drive some of the interest but there is a real trap in thinking that just because you bring a grape variety in plant it somewhere else you can make a wine like that and this is sort of the flip side of what I was talking about earlier when I said I, the thing that grates me the most is when people try to compare what we do with you know a Vermentino from Sardinia or whatever because yes it's the same grape but that is where the similarity stops the cultural practices are different, the climate's different, the intent is different, everything about it is different. And so the interest in Norello Muscalese from people in Australia and both sides of the industry from, you know, production side and also hospitality is really to do with the wines of Etna. Whereas, you know, my research um, that I did, the reason why I was looking at Norello muscalese was because of drought tolerance, high acidity, late ripening, you know, these viticultural sort of aspects. But I was quite clear in my paper 
Um, and I still uh, stand by that. But I think anyone who thinks that they're going to go and plant Morello and make an Etna Rosso kind of wine is kidding themselves. So um, I find it really, really exciting to see what this variety can do in Australia. And I think that because of the viticultural characteristics of the variety that um, there'll be some places we can make some really great wine. Um, but I think, yeah, I think a lot of the interest is generated from the Italian wines and it'll be really a really interesting uh, project to keep an eye on as it rolls out. Um, we ourselves are intending to plant it um, in uh, our Heathcote Vineyard in the top block um, of the Heathcote Vineyard, which is a um, volcanic site um, with uh, an origin of those soils of about 500 million years. So, you know, the world was Gondwana land back then, everything was joined and, you know, like, so this is really old soil. It's been through quite a lot of um, volcanic um, kind of episodes and tectonic movement. Um, and it's actually a, a really interesting um, mix of mineral rocks um, and, you know, mineral rich soils. It's more than 50% rock, not a lot of soil. For instance, when we, uh, the photo of the vineyard in Heathcote I showed before was of that site. When we, when we built vineyards in that um, area, we've had to actually drill with a rock drill the holes for the posts because there's that much rock that you can't actually just put it in like you do when you're putting it within the soil. So this is a photograph of some um, basalt, um, which is some of the oldest stone um, dating back to four to 500 million years in formation um, from our site. So whilst it is not Etna, um, I think that this soil could make um, some really interesting um, wine with Merlot and Muscalese and it'll be the first place we plant those vines aside from the nursery row um, when it comes in. And the other wines that we grow on that site are varieties like Meravola, um, Ayenico and Sagrantino. And when we first established that vineyard, we sort of believed that that hard rocky site on the top of the hill would be great for those gnarly reds. You know, they'll be low yielding, they'll be small vines, will be heavily concentrated, will be perfect for those varieties. And we got the shock of our lives that this mineral rich soil and these small vines with the low yields produce the most perfumed, pretty, elegant examples of Alienico and Sagrantino you've ever tried. Our Alienico looks more like Pinot than something that you would find in Campania. Um, and so I think that Norello Muscalese, and one of the things that people love about Norello from Etna is that delicate um, yet powerful um, personality that, that, that those wines have. So I'm hoping we can make something delicate yet powerful, but altogether Victorian when we eventually plant those vines here. Thank you. That's brilliant. Fascinating. We've got some more questions. Or is everyone absolutely stunned by it? I think end? so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no more questions on here at the moment. So uh... I would just love to ask those of you who are on the line, you know, I mean, are you seeing any of these wines in your respective, you know, local fine wine stores? Are they making it? out of Australia? Are they starting to make it out of Australia? I know Wine Australia after we collaborated on an amazing project in 2015 in London, 21st Century Vino with Walter Speller, Jensis Robinson was there of course, and Wine Australia at Australia House, which was an event um, sort of dreamt up by Chalmers run in Melbourne and then rerunning in London in 2015, which sort of gave birth to the annual alternative varieties tasting, Emma, that now happens in May, is it? Um, are you still running that tasting through Wine Australia? Uh, we, ha we haven't done an alternative varieties one in a while, um, but that's not to say it won't happen in the future. Obviously, everything is <laughs> up in the air at the minute with COVID yeah. anyway. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I think it was uh, 2017 that we that ran the alternative the variety one. showcase at yeah. Australian House. Seems a long time to go now. Have times have changed. Yeah. 
Now that was a great uh, event. It was a real eye opener. Well, I'm hoping that some of those wines are now, you know, making their way into the market. Yes, certainly in the UK here, there's quite a lot of alternative variety wines. I think something like half of all exports of alternative varieties come to the UK of wines labelled with an alternative variety label. Uh, yeah. Not so sure on other markets, but certainly over here. Um, and I think certainly talking to, you know, Soms and Indies over here, there's a lot of interest and excitement on, on those wines. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, that might all, all, you know, change the landscape with, you know, Brexit and, you know, how you view and how you how accessible the wines from next door are and, you know, how expensive they may or may not become and, um, you know, whether or not there's more wines coming from other parts of the world like South Africa and ourselves and South America that might, you know, change the dynamic of some of that shelf space. Who knows? One of our guy, Christos, who's here today, said he drank a still Pinot Meunier from Lethbridge two years ago. <laughs> awesome. So Ray Addison, who's an awesome, another eccentric, fabulous character of wine in Australia, is a customer of ours and has been buying grapes from us since the very early days um, in the mid 2000s and still every year buys grapes from us. So if you've tried his Greco, his Fiano, his Alienico, um, any of those wines, um, uh, even the Malbec, uh, which goes into some of his blends, comes from our vineyard. So, yes, Lethbridge do a wonderful job with many varieties. I think I was on the phone with him the other day and I think he said he had 68 current SKUs on the go and I don't know how he manages that. But anyway, apparently he does. So we could all be drinking wines made from your grapes and we don't know it. <laughs> Well, it's actually wonderful that many of the producers who work with our grapes do actually quote um, the vineyard source on their label, which I think is really lovely. I mean, that's what we expect to see when we go to a restaurant, isn't it? You know, which farm farmed the pork or, mm -hmm. you know, where the cheese came from. So why not have the winemakers, um, you know, giving the provenance of the grapes on the wine label? I think it's a great step, not only for us because it's our name, but for, it, for everybody, for consumers, for everybody to have a full understanding of what they're what's in their glass. Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, unless there's any other questions, um, I think- I can see a couple popping up here on- There's the lots chat. of people saying thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. One person said obviously maybe most of the wines are going into restaurants rather than stores. Yes, um, so, more than likely. Yeah, yeah. And Laura has asked how important were Brown Brothers in alternative varieties? Really important. And Mark Walpole, the viticulturist I spoke of earlier, was their chief viticulturist um, throughout the time that they were doing a lot of exploration into things like Naradabla. Um, in fact, they actually introduced a selection of Alienico and Sagrantino prior to us, but they did some trials in their own vineyard and decided not to take it any further and pulled them out. So um, Mark was... Uh, Mark was there. Mark was at the beginning of the Australian Alternative Varieties Wine Show mm. as well. Um, he spoke at that initial event and he was also connected with Dr. Rod Bonfiglioli and involved in helping select varieties like Nosciola, Schiavatino, et cetera, for us in our first importation. And he was working with Brown Brothers at the time. So they were absolutely another great family owned and run business driving change in Australia. You know, I, I worked for Brown Brothers and the Tarango was one of their varieties that they introduced over here and uh, getting people to drink light red styles. But yeah, they had lots of different varieties like yourselves. Yeah. Well, we guess, I guess we need to draw this to a close, but Kim, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And I think all of us here, um, you know, we owe you a huge thank you for this, but it goes much, much further because what you've done and other pioneers you've mentioned, but particularly the Chalmers family, you've opened up so many new horizons for the future of wine and for everybody who loves wine. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. And listen, we do it because we love it, but it is also very rewarding. So, you know, we feel like proud grandparents when we see all the little Naradabla vines and wines out there and we know that they all came from our one little pot plant or whatever, you know, it's really fun to be part of such an exciting scene. Absolutely. 
Thank you. And just to let you all know, I am very accessible. My email address is on the website. If anyone wakes up in the middle of the night with a question that they wish they'd ask, please just get in touch. Um, We have absolutely no problem answering your questions or um, making more information available should you like to find out something else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, and thank you everybody else for coming and joining us today.